Cameron with Iron Forest Knives here. It's finally time to do an update video on my anodizing process. I've made a lot of changes. I'm getting really good results. And uh, if you guys find value in this video, please like it, share it. And if you want, you can head over to my website and buy a new knife. So let's get started. We're going to anodize these fictives. They are vapor blasted with the glass beads. And they're going to go into the simple green solution. That is just a standard concentration of uh, simple green industrial. They're going to go in there for five minutes, and they are heated to 140 degrees. Uh, I got three different buckets here: post degrease, desmut, post desmut rinse. So I always spray the parts. Uh, I usually hold this thing in my hand and spray out all the little holes. That's the most important part: is to clean all the holes out. But after I do the initial rinse, uh, for one minute, I dip it into a rinse bucket of water. This helps flush out any uh, remaining chemicals. And uh, then after this, I rinse them again. A lot of rinsing in this process. If you get any contamination, your parts are ruined, basically. All right, then they're going to go on D-Smut for five minutes. This is from Caswell Plating. This is at room temperature, by the way. We're going to rinse off the D-smut, which is a pretty strong acid. Um, rinsing, spray rinsing before dip rinsing is really good to make your baths, your rinsing baths, last a lot longer. Uh, I rarely change out my uh, rinsing stuff unless I start having issues. Then it's going to go into the anodizing bath, and this is temperature controlled to 70 degrees. And I'll show you the uh, method I use to cool this later on in the video. Um, and then I have a calculator, which I will link to, that has how to calculate your amps per square foot. And this is Caswell, the LCD method, which is low current density. Uh, with low current density, you get the advantage of much less fumes and also a much weaker uh, sulfuric acid so you don't have to have such nasty chemicals and fumes uh, but as you can see I have a vent that sucks all the air outside I'll show you the vent that I use too goes right under the garage door works great uh, so this goes in for I, I do 90 minutes I do a film I believe I'm doing six amps a square foot which should yield me I think a about eight tenths thickness of anodizing so uh, I pulled it out of the anodizing, rinsed it. Now it's going into the neutralizing bath for a minute. Rinse again. And this neutralizer, you really, really want to get it off. This stuff will really uh, affect your uh, dying big time. So it has to be completely clean. Pretty much every step is like that, but... And it's going to go into a just a rinse bucket, and I'm going to dip this for a solid minute, just like that. And this might seem overboard, even from an some anodizers might think this is overboard. Uh, but you know what? There's nothing worse than ruining parts or having to re-anodize them. I'm very cautious, <laughs> and it works. Uh, I'm getting really good results. So. So I do uh, a high mix of colors. I have offer 100 different color combinations, which is essentially 10 colors on two parts. Color them all individually. I could do batches, but then I would be sitting on lots of inventory, which isn't a good idea either. This is the waiting tank where I loosen all the fasteners and it allows me to pull all the parts separately and dye them by themselves. That way I can do a bunch of parts, a bunch of different colors without having to do a bunch of different anodizing cycles basically this is where they get their final rinsing before dying just to make sure there's no contamination on them we're gonna dye this thing for 15 minutes in green uh, every dye takes a very different amount of time some of my dyes are about 20 seconds after dye they get a quick rinse and then they go into nickel acetate which is legitimately toxic um, 
you do not want to get it on you and it does build up in your system so it is I, I tried to avoid using it for a long time and I just did a hot um, seal but from this book that I am recommending very highly he says that you really can't get a real seal without using nickel acetate so uh, I did the switch and I'm glad that I did I think that it's better I was trying to keep it less, less toxic just because you know I'm doing this in my house but um, I just you know I'm just really really careful uh, this book was about hundred dollars and it really distills everything you need to know um, into a fairly short book but it's extremely detailed the only thing I'm doing differently than the book is LCD anodizing which requires less power weaker acid and less cooling and has lower fumes so it's basically just safer and requires a little bit less equipment to do it well it does mean that your acid concentration is going to need to be held within a different range but that's pretty much the only difference I'll do a separate video uh, to show how to do a acid titration to measure the level of acid in your anodizing bath and to measure the dissolved aluminum uh, which is really important to get consistent results so let's talk about some of the equipment you're going to be needing a lot of clean water and so you need an RO and DI system uh, this thing puts out zero parts per million water and I think it'll do 100 gallons a day although the RO measurements for gallons is unusual it's it's a percentage but uh, this one I'm really happy with it was $180 on Amazon and then I have two pressure tanks that are underneath my workbench and that water gets plumbed from the tanks to my milling machine my blasting cabinets and to my anodizing setup I designed this 3d printed vent so that I didn't have to drill a giant hole in my brick wall um, it works really well, it's only half an inch thick, and I will provide a download link so you guys can print your own. Although the slab may be different because the little step where your garage door sits may be a different size. Here's the temperature controllers. They, you can plug a heater and a cooler into the same one and it will keep it within the range, which I'll probably have to do this winter time. Uh, right now I'm just cooling my anodizing bath. And then uh, as my heater, I use these 500 watt cartridge heaters. Uh, they're really inexpensive. You solder them to a power cord and then use heat shrink. And uh, they heat up really well. They're like $7 a piece or something like that. Here's my power supply. I think it's 30 amps, or no, sorry, 10 amps at 30 volts, something like that. They don't make this one anymore, but there's a lot of good ones on Amazon. The one thing you want to make sure that it has the capability of doing is being constant current, which is pretty important for anodizing. People also do constant voltage, but it sounds like the results are a little bit more spotty. Air is also really important in the anodizing process. So it agitates the water, it evens out the temperature differentials in the tank, and uh, this is a valve that just it allows me to plumb air wherever. Here's the inside of the tank. You can see that I've got a lead plate uh, connected to stainless hardware through the bucket so that I can connect the lead to the outside and in the bottom right there you can see that I have a uh, hose with a quarter 20 stainless fastener as a weight holding it down there are definitely better options for this I just haven't uh, <laughs> it's been working fine so I haven't uh, had the initiative to change it I have learned recently that an aluminum cathode is actually better it's in that book that I recommended it has better conduction, which makes the bath not heat up as much. You don't have to worry about lead contamination, which affects your anodizing sometimes and is also makes the acid harder to dispose of. Uh, but more details in the book. Um, yeah, here's the bolt coming out through the outside. I know stainless isn't very conductive electricity of electricity, but I didn't really have anything else that would survive the sulfuric acid. Here's what I'm using to cool my anodizing bath. Uh, I didn't want to buy a titanium core chiller. They're really expensive and seemed like overkill. So I found this pad. It's for injuries. You pump cold water through it, and it's like icing, but more convenient, I guess. And so I wrapped it around the bucket, and I pump air and to circulate the water inside the bucket so that it constantly is getting fresh acid to the side of the bucket and it cools the bath down. Even though it's plastic and has poor conductivity of heat, 
it still works really well. Um, so I have ice water in a small one gallon cooler with a small pump and it just circulates and the temperature is controlled and I, it, it keeps it within a half a degree, maybe even closer than that uh, usually. And I'm really happy with it. Turned out great. Here's what I'm using for my dye because my parts are tiny and I don't, you know, I, I do so many colors that uh, I put all of them in that ice chest and heat them all up at the same time and they stay hot. It doesn't use much electricity. Works really well. Um, they are mason jars with plastic lids. If you use steel lids, they will rust 100% in that environment. But most people probably are doing bigger parts, so they'll need like a two gallon bucket or something. But you'll have to heat that two gallon bucket. It's kind of a pain. Um, I was using one gallon igloo coolers for a while, uh, but with 10 colors and doing a really high mix of colors, it was just too much of a pain to have to heat up two colors at a time and only anodize a certain amount of parts at a time. So now I can anodize a bunch of parts and then color them all separately and it doesn't take that long. So I, this is perfect for my size of parts. Here is my racking. So I rack from the top and that works for my parts because I'm moving them a lot. Uh, and racking is really, 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 really important. If you have bad connection to your parts, uh, some parts are going to get more amperage than others, and it'll mess up basically all of the parts. Your colors won't be as consistent. So I use welding wire to make my racking. Um, I rack vertically uh, just because of the way that I do my parts. It makes more sense. You have to have a lot of spring tension to be able to get good contact. And I found that if you put a fulcrum in the middle, you can get a lot more force. And that's pretty much it for this video. Uh, my next one will be how to do an anodizing titration and um, the aluminum content of your anodizing bath to make sure that your chemistry is right. So if you guys have any questions, please put them down in the comments. I'll do my best to get to all of them. I'll put a link to a Google Sheet down below so that you guys can see the list of all the materials and products that I use. If you found this video helpful, please like, share, and subscribe, and thank you for watching.